Thank you. So, predictions are hard, particularly to those concerning the future. So at the beginning of this semester at Berkeley, we thought rather than doing predictions of elections, we should change the way society works. If you think about it for a moment, everything we do pretty much is recorded. That's also here, of course, why I'm recording you. Google knows all of our desires. Facebook knows all of our attention, and so on. So why do we still have elections? Why don't we just let Google, Facebook, maybe Uber, pick our governments? Wouldn't that be better rather than quantizing it every four years? Anyways, so by training, I'm a physicist. I was at CERN in the 80s, and there, what we did is we looked how material interacts with the other. We studied physical interactions. So in some way, the last century was a century of physical interactions. So last century was a century of physical interactions. Uh, this century is a century of social interactions, where social interactions get recorded. So if you think back not only to uh, the uh, uh, 1600s here, but to, let's say, 1985, that was a time when we learned to connect computers. 95, we learned to connect pages. And by connecting pages, we got metadata, we got richer data, and those richer data allowed us to actually create a company called Google, which, based on those metadata, did a much better job in ranking search results than if you just look at the text by itself. 2005, about connecting people. So that, of course, is Facebook. And if you think about that and compare it to what people now knowingly and willingly reveal on Facebook, the KGB wouldn't have gotten out of them under torture. So all of these examples are examples of data refineries. So I would say that this decade here is a decade of refining data. And I want to give you a little uh, idea about what I mean by refining data. A few years ago, I was invited to give a talk to the United Nations with the title, Data is the New Oil. And that's where this metaphor of refining data comes from, that you get it somewhere, and then uh, you thank you. Then uh, you uh, refine it, and then you consume it, and so on and so forth. But is this really the right metaphor? Because Yes, we all know we are going to run out of oil at some stage. But I don't think we'll be running out of data, at least in any time soon. So maybe a better metaphor would be data as a new soil. Or if we do want to stick with the energy metaphor, maybe data is the new nukes. Because if something can go wrong with data, it can go very wrong. Now, Stepping back, let's look at how the role of data actually has changed. And now I'm taking the business perspective. Most of my talk, and also the book I'm writing on transparency, most of my talk is from the consumer perspective. But here, let's talk for a moment business. Data used to be used for optimization. It was like an add-on which you have in order to do things better but to play the same old game, just better, faster, cheaper. Then, game changer, data became the product. So if you think about Google, Google isn't doing the same stuff people did before, just better, faster, cheaper, but Google actually changes how we do things. Or think Amazon. Amazon changes how we think about purchases. Or think Facebook. Facebook changes how we think of ourselves, how we think about ourselves, who we are. And it's not just the few of us here in this room or maybe in the Bay Area. It is, in each case, a billion people change through those refineries that take the data of the people, by the people, and make them data 
for other people. Now, in the third stage, which we're entering right now, data really has become sort of something which we breathe, like air, or if you were a fish, which you would be swimming in. So data has become like an infrastructure, like a fabric which we use to weave things together. And what I wanted to show you is a couple of examples of what those refinery have as the raw materials for the infrastructure. Here is a screenshot from this morning. Google, I did 24,359 searches on Google, excluding those in porn mode. So if you think about that, 25,000 expressions of what I'm interested in. That is more than anybody in the world knows about me, maybe even than I know about myself. Another example, geolocation. Again, you go to google.com slash history. And this is a trip I took with my students two weeks ago. We started the day here at Berkeley. I mean, I live in San Francisco, went over to Berkeley. We went to where the data stuff gets created. We went to Intel. And we tried to answer the question in their medical group, when will be their time? where we don't need doctors anymore because we have so many sensors that actually doctors become obsolete, similar to the election example at the beginning. If you go to the doctor once every year, it's just as bad as going to the election every four years if you can observe more or less in real time what you're actually up to, how you actually are feeling. We ended the day, just to cut it short here, at Google, and we ended with the question, when will be the time where we actually don't need people anymore because we have all these computers. So that's just an example, going back to the talk, of all these details. Google knows about me, where I went, how long I was there. And you can go back two years. Pretty scary. By the way, who of you thinks that if I had all your searches from Google, that would be even more sketchy than having all of your geolocations. So who thinks that the searches are something which is even more personal than geolocation? Who thinks that geolocation is even more personal than searches are? So I would say 80% of the people think their searches are and 20% people think where they are. Now, we often say, oh, my data is so valuable. Like that picture when I was a child was walking with my grandfather in our little street back in Germany. But from a business perspective, the value of data really is the impact this data has on decisions. And it's very important in much of the polemic attitudes you have towards Facebook, etc., that people don't really distinguish what is the decision that depends on the data. Now, I'm a big fan of data refineries, and if I think about the decisions I take, many of them do totally depend on social data, depend on data other people created and shared. Like yesterday in class, we had two people from Airbnb talking about identity and trust, and trust and safety. That totally depends on the data other people have shared whether some random dude is showing up at your place and you let him stay there, or whether you are showing up probably even, even more sketchy at some random person's place. So those are decisions that are based on the data people create. Of course, the trivial one of traffic, we all know that Google adjusts the traffic based on how cars are moving, and none of us probably uses maps anymore, maps with these paper-printed things. I don't even know how one would do that while driving, which would put them on the window. No. Um, so it is interesting how those data really change the way we make decisions as consumers. I want to walk you through a couple of examples from my time at Amazon, how Amazon helps people make better decisions based on the data other people create. And in Jeff Bezos' term, the goal really is to make it trivially easy for people to contribute to connect and to collaborate. 
So you all know customers who bought X also bought Y. And I would like to look at this item here. What do you think goes with that item? <laughs> Last week, I was in London. And I actually Googled it and what came up? That's the US version with the Asian kid. But that is the UK version. <laughs> so if you get, go to Amazon.co.uk, it is just data of the people, by the people, maybe for the people. Going back a few years, actually about 10 years ago, um, I have a house in Shanghai. And uh, I spent Christmas Day, you know, what else would I be doing, having a debate at one of the schools there with Jack Ma. And actually, I can't read Chinese, so I don't know what these characters mean. I hope that poster doesn't have anything embarrassing about Jack or about me. But I did look at the transcript from that conversation just a couple of weeks ago when I prepared for my class this semester. And I was struck not by what we said, but what we didn't say. In those one and a half hours of conversation, the word mobile wasn't mentioned a single time. So if you reflect on this from the perspective of data, what really has changed in the last 10 years, there's no question about it in my mind. It really is mobile. And why? For me, a number of reasons. One is the mobile has so many sensors. So of course, there's a microphone, a camera, but then GPS, barometer. So I, I'm a physicist, so I love thinking about the world in terms of physics. So you, of course, don't know how high you really are in principle, how the air pressure changes and you know, calibrate your barometer. But if you are moving around from building to building, chances are you are at street level, unless you're Superman flying. So that means you now are pretty well calibrated. Now, as you're getting into the building, and hopefully you're taking the stairs as opposed to the elevator, you can tell really how many steps you're going by combining the accelerometer, because each time you step on a stair, it has a little shock. Then, of course, the barometer, but also the sound. You see how actually the acoustics might be changing and getting from one floor to another. So it is pretty amazing about what level of granularity our phone, or in this case, Google Glass, or my Apple Watch create. And what I want to invite you is to think that all of that would be recorded. All of that will be recorded. So the question is no longer. Can you record this? Are you allowed to record this? The question is, assume it is recorded. Now, what would you do with it? If you had access to all of your data, maybe also your partner's data, although probably many relationships would break over that, um, over the last 10, 20 years, on that granularity, what really would you do with it? So I think one of the key questions which will come up here again and again is the question about identity. Not philosophically in this case about who we are, but more the function of identity of knowing that the person is the person who is saying. Some of you, like most of my students, weren't alive when this cartoon came out. On the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Slight change to now. On the internet, everybody knows you're a dog. So how has our notion of identity shifted in those 10 or 20 years? I think we have seen a shift from an identity which is based on attributes, like my Stasi file at the beginning, where I was born, to an identity based on relationships that you are basically who your friends are. Yesterday in class also we had Steve Huffman, who is back as the CEO of Reddit. And we talked about identity, we talked about Reddit. 
And one of the most interesting things he said was that he heard that you are basically just the sum of the five best friends you have in life. So I thought that was interesting. So it really plays to our notion of identity that you are not really where you're born, but you are who you hang out with. And maybe it really is just the few friends who have influenced you most. Now, there are many applications of those graph data to business to life. And I want to pick two. A German company called Friendsurance. They are an insurance company and they say, well, if you are willing to say, like Leland is a good guy, if Leland say loses his phone, I think actually he did lose his phone. So I'm happy to give him a hundred bucks. And that way the insurance you might have, property insurance or just losing your phone insurance, which tends to peak on the days when new iPhones come out. Um, that insurance would have a slightly lower premium because his deductible is now $100 higher. And so you can now verify the graph by how much money people are willing to actually bet on a friend. That's quite an interesting perspective beyond just accepting somebody as Facebook friend because they're cute, but to actually say, well, if there's an insurance claim, I think I will help them out. Now think about what this does to the ecosystem. The ecosystem is when that new iPhone comes out, Leland knows that if he sort of loses his old one, Andreas would know about it and give him a hundred bucks, but he probably would not, you know, fight a claim. And that's a very important element that people, as we become more social, just change their behavior as things are becoming observed. Another example is peer-to-peer -peer finance. Actually, in class next week, we have Jonathan Ng and Paul Gu, who run Upstart, come to class. Upstart gives people loans. It's primarily in the space of uh, college people in the late 20s uh, who want to pay back their college loans or revolving credit cards. So the good thing is before people come, I can always wildly fantasize about what data sources they would be using, what the richest data is. And I think if I was running Upstart, I would absolutely request the tapes that you had when you were a child and learning to play the piano or the violin, if you're Asian or in my case, playing the cello. Um, now, because that is like the modern marshmallow test. Are you practicing those pieces which you're not good at, or are you just happy go merry playing those pieces which you're already good at? And that tells you about your propensity to pay back the loan. So if you think this thing about this piano tapes is not really realistic, then let me tell you what really is going on. Fennel, yes, ladies and gentlemen, fennel, you know what you eat, is one of the most important predictors of whether somebody is paying back a loan. That's based on a British bank, which did all kinds of, all kinds of data mining, and what they found is that fact about fennel. You might be wondering why. Fennel is a typical upper middle class vegetable, and it takes time to prepare. So it's not just, you know, you buy some fennel and you eat it, but you follow recipes. All these things are related with people actually being, paying back their loans. So, as Jerry Friedman, one of my PhD advisors, said, well, the good thing about algorithms is they find patterns whether they are there or not. <laughs> uh, so to summarize here, to avoid finding patterns whether they are not, I have four rules for you. Rule number one is start with a problem, not with the data. If you start with the data, then given that data grows exponentially with a doubling time of one and a half years, you will be hosed because you just can't clean the data even with cloud flower. You can't clean the data as fast as they come in. So be clear, what is the question? What is the problem you're trying to solve? Sounds familiar? Two, 
Focus on the decisions and the actions you can take. You know, in some way, the world we live in here and what we are speaking for or against has been influenced by what happened before us. For example, there were all these consultants who said, oh, you know, if you like McDonald's or make something, uh, make something, these consultants, you know, um, that they come and they say, well, you know, if you give us all this data, we will give you insights, actionable insights. When I was at Amazon and McKinsey was in the building, Jeff Bezos said, I give him five minutes. If they're not out of the building, I get the police. So it is not about insights or actual insights. It's really about actions. Third point, try to write down your equation of business or what we at Amazon called the fitness function, not in terms of your, what your shareholders want to see, not in terms of your stores or the bananas which are rotting somewhere, but in terms of your consumers. So for example, let's say an item is coming a day earlier than Amazon promised it. So today is Wednesday. They said the item would be coming tomorrow. Instead, actually, it could be coming today already. First obvious thing, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Good thing? The answer is, of course, it depends. Like if you live, like I live in San Francisco in the Castro, what happens is I get a door tag and it says, sorry, we missed you. Can you please come between 6 and 7 a.m. tomorrow morning and pick, the airport, pick up the, airport, the, the apple at the item? The, pick up the item at the airport. So in this case, it's a bad thing. Tomorrow I'll be home. Today I won't be home. So it depends on the custom perspective. Of course, being a day early is not at all as bad as it would be being a day late. So that is an example of putting together that fitness function or that equation of business where top people, Jeff Bezos signed off on those, figure out how do our customers see the world. And the last point is let people do what people are good at and let computers do what computers are good at. Don't confuse the two. Well, that clearly must be a sentence which resonates here with Crowdflower. I sometimes add a fifth one, particularly when I think about institutions like universities, that don't blame technology, advanced technology, for problems that you have in your institution. So I think in many cases, uh, people use technology and then they say this technology's problem what actually are much more institutional problems. For example, Stanford. Stanford has a rule to not allow people, instructors, to use third-party software, which I think is ridiculous. So last year, I did one of the problem sets on LinkedIn. You know, what's the problem LinkedIn is trying to solve? What data sources would you look at? And so on. And then I got, you know, a note from a person high up at the university telling me that he has come to his attention that third-party software has been used. And you are really wondering which planet such people live on. Anyways, um, uh, I want you to think about two questions. One, when you ask people for data, do the people who you ask actually understand how the world would be a better place for them if they give you those data. Two, does your product, your service, get better with data, get better over time? Or does it actually get worse over time? I think we all know examples for both. I think these are good questions to keep in mind. So if you look back, over the last few years, and then think about what it means going forward. How has data connectivity, meaning mobile, cloud, the refineries we all depend on, how has it changed you in the last decade or so? How has it changed your community? And then if we don't think of the timescale of a couple of hundred, uh, a couple of dozen years, 
but just the time scale of a couple of thousand years. Let's go back to Plato. And when I was reflecting, you know, how do I see the world? I realized that Plato's allegory of the cave very much applies to the world we live in now. Because let's say you want to know something. You only see it the way that Google, in the best of their intentions, tries to present it to you. There's no way of actually seeing the information per se as such. There's really only way of seeing the world of information through the eyes of Google, Yahoo, Bing, etc. Then I was thinking, well, you know, about my friends. And I realized, just specifically, when uh, the Supreme Court judgment on gay marriage came out, I thought, wow, that's amazing. So many of my friends applied that rainbow filter. And then I realized, I actually have no way. If in the people rank algorithm, Mark Zuckerberg says, if people apply the rainbow filter, push them up. So when I look at your friends, all your friends have rainbow filter. It might only be 20 friends of yours who apply the rainbow filter. It suddenly looks that way. So that really is, I think, the way it is for Plato already, that we have no way of knowing things. But we have way of asking the refineries, of querying the refineries, of how holding the refineries accountable, and trying to really push them in sharing the algorithms with us, us doing experiments. I know one of the Crowdflower examples is that actually academics get to use Crowdflower to check out how Google varies for different people. So to indirectly go to the refineries. I want us to have a seat at the controls of those refineries in the following way. Take LinkedIn. I love the scenario product they're working on, where you could say, well, if I wasn't majoring in physics, but if I was majoring in computer science, how would that affect my probability of getting a job as an investment banker at Goldman Sachs five years down the road? So LinkedIn has all the data. It is taking the data they have, of course, putting your situation, but giving you some knobs having you actually play with the data and see how that searches the world you see. So I don't view myself as a prisoner. So the allegory of the cave certainly ends before that parallel. But I think it's worth thinking how actually has this data world we live in and this mediated world of only observing the shadows changed the balance of power. So here's my last slide. If you think how data, how social data has revolutionized the way of power differentials we live in. Let's say students and professors. You know, the students can Google anything in real time. I better be right. Or let's say citizens and government. Or patients and doctors. Eric Topol has come out with a book called The Patient Will See You that precisely addresses that fact of the change in the balance of power. So I am having 20 seconds left. So if somebody has a quick question, I'm happy to take that. Otherwise, here's my contact information and my website and the YouTube channel and I'll be around for the rest of the day and would love to chat with you how the social data revolution really is changing what you do. Thank you.